We are an anti-consumerist, anti-capitalist show, but if you are in the mood to give gifts this winter, we suggest you give the gift of activist news. To become a patron of our show, visit patreon.com slash act out. This week on Act Out, some oil-soaked headlines and low lives that you need to be made aware of, plus your last chance to stand up for free speech in the digital age. On December 14th, telecoms will attempt to turn the internet into a series of toll roads and slow lanes. Guess where we are. Here's how you can stop them. And finally, Nick Brana joins the show again to talk about the new movement for a people's party, collaboration on the left, and the inevitable downfall of the monopolistic two-party system. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is Act Out. Welcome to Act Out. I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your Tipping Point. Our first headline this week requires us to look at some new old news regarding the Keystone XL pipeline. On November 16th, TransCanada announced a more than 200,000-gallon oil spill in South Dakota. A couple of weeks later, it came to light that the cause of the leak was actually an almost eight-year-old snafu. The spill was likely caused because of mechanical damage that occurred when this portion of the pipeline was built in 2008. The damage, the investigators add, was probably caused by a weight installed at the time. Weights are apparently added to pipelines in areas of the line where changing water levels could cause the pipeline to float. Furthermore, it turns out that TransCanada received a special permit in 2007 allowing it to operate at a stress level higher than regulations typically allow. The company got a permit for it to be operated at a stress level of 80% of what the steel pipe should be able to handle at a minimum, as opposed to the typical 72 Well, that's awfully comforting. So I have an idea. In light of this and the fact that Keystone has leaked substantially more oil and more often in the U.S. than the company indicated to regulators in risk assessments before operations began in 2010, in in light of all this, why don't we just uh, shut that shit down once and for all? Oh, that's right, because we as a nation are but an oil company with an army, as George Carlin put it. Further evidenced by the fact that last Tuesday, TransCanada restored the Keystone XL at a reduced pressure level, neither saying what that actually means, nor stating when the pipeline would be back to full capacity. Meanwhile, over in Nebraska, regulators approved a route for the same fucking pipeline a mere four days after the spill in South Dakota. Environmental groups have vowed to fight the decision, and as the approved route is not the preferred route of the company, hope springs eternal in overturning the decision of those diseased dipshit regulators, marinating in crude oil and tar-stained morals. In very related news, last week, On the same day that the Senate Budget Committee passed a bill allowing oil and natural gas drilling in Alaska's pristine Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, the Trump administration granted oil company Eni's request to explore for oil in the nearby Alaska waters. Eni could start exploratory drilling as early as this month. Lawsuits against the drilling are currently pending in Alaska courts. And as for drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, the go-ahead is couched inside the Senate Tax Reform Bill, which passed late last week, and as of this taping, is being volleyed between shitbags in the Senate and House before moving on to the desk of our putrid pustain, who will sign it into law. So... Besides widening the already abysmal, in all senses of that word, income inequality gap, slashing access to healthcare, education, housing, and solidifying handouts to the most wealthy, this tax bill is essentially condemning to death the water, animals, and land currently secured in the wildlife refuge of Alaska. Which, of course, in turn, only hastens our drive to climate catastrophe. And while this all sounds dramatic, it's unfortunately not hyperbole. Oil spills are an inherent part of the oil business, kind of like breaking a fucking egg is essential to making an omelet. 
A recent infographic created using federal data on oil spills shows that over the last two and a half years, crude oil and hazardous materials pipelines across the U.S. busted at a rate of more than once per day through corrosion, floods, lightning, vehicles, and vandals. That doesn't even take into account incidents on natural gas lines. And, as we've covered in previous episodes, that also doesn't take into account the smaller spills that aren't reported and therefore aren't included in this federal data. The 3.6 million gallons of crude oil outlined in this report as having spilled between 2015 and 2017 are therefore an underestimation. And as you can see from the interactive map, this underestimation is an overwhelming display of the horrifying effects of placing our present and thereby our future in the hands of oil companies who will always value petroleum and profit far above either people or planet. In all senses of the word, undoubtedly some of the lowest, most toxic, most grotesque lowlife scum. You lowlife scum. Now, moving on, cue the broken record, or the broken internet. This content has been blocked by your service provider. Sorry, don't bother trying again. I know I talk about this ad nauseum, but trust me, it's not because I'm particularly tech-savvy, and nor is it because I love the way that net neutrality awkwardly falls out of my mouth every time I say it. No, it's because it's that important, and I cannot possibly stress this enough. Everything, absolutely everything that we care about has a digital component that we rely on for information, collaboration, building, sharing, creating, etc. As an example, racial justice. How the hell does that relate to net neutrality? Well, allow Annika Navaroli from Color of Change to explain. We can say, you know what? No one's talking about our stories. No one is telling the story that we've always known for forever of us being killed in the streets. And we were able to do that online, and we are still able to do that online. And that, that is amazing, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Being able to tell your own story, that is absolutely amazing, especially for a group of folks who historically haven't had a voice, you know? No one's let us talk on the media, no one's let us do all of these things. And now we're able to organize for ourselves. And that's just one example. How about the movements to support black businesses, to stand up against police brutality by organizing, strategizing online? Pick another issue, and the story is exactly the same. Go beyond specific movements and consider what else you use the internet for. Simply connecting with loved ones far away, getting information from people on the, on the ground, rather than relying on the twisted propaganda coming from our corporate media. The list is literally endless. So that's why I keep bringing this up. And that is why I'm going to run through what you need to do right now to protect your access to your own free speech. One, contact Congress. Battleforthenet.com will connect you via both email and phone to your representatives so that you can tell them directly how important the internet is to you. This action is important because Congress has the power to stop the FCC vote. Two, on December 7th, attend a protest at a Verizon center or store. Before joining the FCC, Chairman Ajit Pai was a Verizon lawyer. His plans to block your access to the internet are essentially a corporate handout to old pals from Verizon, who he'll doubtlessly go back to through the revolving door once this is all over. So on December 7th, people across the country will protest outside of Verizon stores while calling on and emailing their members of Congress to demand they stand up to Verizon and for an open internet. For more information on that, visit verizonprotests.com. And three, if you can, come to D.C. to join us for an action and overnight vigil outside the FCC on December 13th. We'll hold space legally starting in the afternoon into the evening, using that time to continue spreading our message via social media, on-site media, props, signs, and projections like this one. In the morning, we'll wake up nice and early to perform an action at the FCC and then support a wake-up call rally put on by Voices for Internet Freedom. For more info on that, visit http bit.ly overnightvigil. Now, I know that that's a lot of info coming at you at once, 
To peruse this at your own pace, either take a screenshot of our bullet point list or head to this bit link, http bit.ly slash stop the FCC vote, where you'll get all of this information with links plus a little bit more background. These actions are vital and you sharing and spreading them are equally important. A Media Matters study found that in over a week after the initial reports came in about the FCC's plans to kill net neutrality, NBC, ABC, and CBS had devoted just over two minutes combined to net neutrality. So we have to be our own bullhorn on this. We have to be the messengers and the ones taking a stand for our free speech, our right to inform, be informed, to share, learn, collaborate, and build. We have to be on the front lines. Finally this week, I'd like to welcome back to the show Nick Brana, who we had with us in episode 103 to talk about the draft Bernie campaign. Last week, we sat down with Nick to discuss the movement for a people's party, the evolution of the draft Bernie campaign, how and why now is the time to harness collective frustration, and how we might unite the left, a tall order. Take a look. One of the dynamics that we see in the independent left is that there's tons of energy and that the great majority of uh, progressives, just like the great majority of Americans, now want a major new party, but there's no kind of big center of gravity. And so, sin but since then, uh, you know, our strategy has shifted basically to building up that movement. We built up such a great following and so, you know, we, and we came across, we, I feel like we excited so many people, uh, thousands of people, that after the Convergence Conference in September, um, and after having gotten 50,000 people on board with this, we said, we're, you know, we've got to continue. This movement needs to continue, even if Bernie isn't ready to, uh, to leave the Democratic Party yet, you know. Most of us have seen enough. The majority of mm -hmm. Americans have seen enough, you know. And so, like, we're full speed ahead towards building a coalition uh, for a people's party. You know, we are unique in that way and that we're giving voice to this perspective in the United States that there needs to be a coalition of, of all kinds of different groups that come together at this point, you know, to, to form a new party because that's the perspective of the, of the majority. And, you know, and so the progressive movement shouldn't be, we, sh we shouldn't let kind of the American people be the ones who are more radical than us, you know? It's like the American right. people are saying, no, we want a new party. We don't want to deal with the Democratic Party anymore. You know, we don't, have, we don't have confidence in them. There was a poll that came out just a couple of weeks ago that showed the Democrats are at their lowest favorability since like before the internet was invented. You know, <laughs> like right. the past 25 years. <laughs> So you'd mentioned the, the convergence and something that I was really impressed with was that you brought people from so many different parts of the left and in a way that I haven't seen before uh, in my 15 plus years of, of organizing, there were socialists and there were greens and there were communists, there were undecideds and you'd brought all these people together for a, a literal convergence and talking about next steps. Talk about that, and this was in September, talk about how that coalition has grown, has it changed, what are your plans with this coalition going forward? Yeah, um, I was also really happy that we were able to bring all of those groups together. You know, you never know when you embark kind of on that mission. Uh, but I think one of the things that's most heartening for me is that there is kind of a new awareness that I haven't ever seen before among different groups that, you know, um, that this is that the crisis has reached a level that it has never reached before, you know, uh, and that only by collaborate and that we what we've been doing so far isn't working, you know. There's no expectation that like, you know, if we just kind of continue along the same trajectory as the independent left for you know another few years, all of a sudden we're gonna overthrow you know the Democrats and Republicans in 2020, you know. Rather, there's an understanding now that something needs to change and we need to, we really need to uh, try new things. A, a little aside on that is that there was a very exciting, there were some very exciting developments at the latest um, annual AFL-CIO conference. This was a few weeks ago where the AF, uh, they decided actually, first of all, they decided not to invite the Democrats to their conference, which was, uh, which was a break from tradition. Mm -hmm. But they also decided to pass a couple of resolutions saying that they are going to explore independent third-party politics. And there was a meeting 
of, of many union leaders uh, to discuss the idea of forming a labor party. And so, you know, the idea that this is picking up traction, you know, in different kind of sectors of society, including in the labor movement, that there's many people who are no longer willing to put up with it. And so all of those different conversations that we're having um, have continued, you know, and I think it will be it will be a process, you know, to discuss with them of like what the ultimate collaboration looks like. But I think the ultimate goal, certainly from our perspective, is that we need a nationally viable, um, progressive electoral vehicle, a party that represents the people and that and that totally redefines the concept of a party as well. And so it's, you know, as opposed to these corporate behemoths that we have in the Democratic and Republican Party, this is entirely membership controlled. Um, you know, it allows the election of its leaders. It allows uh, not just the, the chairperson, but other other leaders as well. It allows recall, you know, and of course it has a, a, a firmly and unabashedly progressive um, platform, you know, modeled after Bernie Sanders' uh, 2016 uh, platform, which really, you know, is what ignited this this uh, right. this revolution. Yeah. So, in, I mean, in th this country used to have a pretty robust socialist party and communist party before uh, the, the system cracked down on it. Are you getting a sense from the existing um, socialist parties, the Green Party, the Justice Party, are you getting a sense from them that they're willing to coalesce into, into one under this People's Party? Or is there still like sort of this... I want to do my own thing and we want to just be socialist or we want to just be greens. Like how is, are people willing on the left to stop the infighting and come together? What has your sense been with that? I think that people ultimately will be willing. Uh, I don't know exactly what, you know, some kind of like shared, you know, vehicle or collaboration is going to look like yet, but I do think people are willing and that it, you know, and that's the first step. And I think people are willing to discuss that now, whereas, you know, previously they weren't. Mm -hmm. They say, look, well, how is it that we get all these different forces, you know, uh, and, and we focus it, we focus this power. And one thing that, that I think is really important to say here too, is that I have seen enough now that I believe that a new, a new party is inevitable. Mm -hmm. There is um, uh, confidence in institutions in the U.S., is has, has never been lower it's a historic lows affiliation with both major parties historic lows um, the number of independents historic highs large plurality mm -hmm. the number of people calling for major third party historic highs you know these are trends that cannot continue forever and so there are now very powerful very wealthy people who are taking notice and they're saying there's a new electoral reality in the u.s and so I believe that if we don't do it, um, someone else will, whether it's kind of a, a, a billionaire or whether it's Steve Bannon, you know, but someone else, a member of the establishment will come along, they'll fill that void. Very much like what happened in France. In France, the establishment defended the two parties that have been in power for decades uh, in their past election in 20, th this year. Mm -hmm. um, and they defended them right up until they realized that they were gonna fall, and then they switched strategies. And then the establishment built a third party they, that was a neoliberal party, but that messaged itself as a, as a you know, third way and progressive party. And it, man and it worked actually, it man that, and that was Emmanuel Macron. It worked, it got Emmanuel Macron as a neoliberal elected. And I'm concerned that if we don't take the initiative, the establishment will do the same in this country. So the question always becomes when you're dealing with electoral politics is that it's such a like it's such a swamp, it's such a sewer of just greedy <laughs> refuse. And, say that again. <laughs> <laughs> and so this idea of like trying to beat them at their own game, you know, our system is so rigged. You have everything from interstate cross check to gerrymandering to and so playing this game, even if you have a base of like really incredible grassroots and well-meaning organizations, I, are you gonna are you gonna run up against these billionaire roadblocks and like how are you is there something in your organizing that's that's set to deal with that sort of thing or? Mm -hmm. yeah uh, we can never bring attention to those things you know like for example the fact that the debates are run by a private corporation of the two parties of mm -hmm. uh, the Democrats and Republicans we'll never bring attention to that until 
we have a mass movement and a mass kind of electoral vehicle that is saying, yes, we want to compete and represent a different perspective. And then when people find out that, hold on a minute, you know, the establishment has, and the two parties have created all of these obstacles, people will be outraged to a degree that they've never been before. They say, you know, oh, I have a different democratic perspective. And when they realize like we do, that the two parties have just entrenched themselves in this way, it will accelerate their decline. Because people will say, what the heck is this? I just, you know, I want to compete. Isn't this a democracy? I should be able to express my perspective. They'll feel the outrage that we do. So let, let's talk about Bernie because he was obviously integral to the, the, the concept of draft Bernie, obviously. Yeah. Um, and he's said that he's going to run in 2018. There have been mutterings about 2020. How is he still a, an important part of your organizing now? Or are you just kind of have him on the periphery like, OK, if you want to call us, you have our number. But we're <laughs> going to do this shit over here. And you do whatever you feel you need to do over there. We are, you know, we're going to continue inviting him and encouraging him because if he ever was to leave the Democratic Party, it would be terrific. Right. But one of the most telling things that we encountered over the past year is that despite Bernie being inside the Democratic Party and, you know, most popular politician in the country, and despite Donald Trump being in the Republican Party, both of those things should be leading this amazing, into this incredible surge into the opposition party you know, into the Democratic Party. But rather what we see, and like, as, as even the authors of the, um, of the autopsy report came out a few weeks ago uh, for the Democratic Party, what we see is that uh, rather people continue to leave the Democratic Party. So you think even with Bernie over there and even with Trump on the other side, people are still leaving. You know, and so you think, wow, what could it possibly take to reverse that? What would do it? You know, those historical trends are continuing. And so that's why, you know, we hope we'll come to that conclusion. But the majority of Americans have come to that conclusion, irrespective of what Bernie's doing. And so, you know, those are the folks that we're saying that the progressive movement should listen to. We're saying rather than struggling against the progressive tide, you know, we should be embracing it. Right. We should say this is wonderful. People are, le people are seeing past, you know, the duopoly. They're seeing past the corporate parties. That is such a blessing. It's such a gift. And rather than struggling against that, you know, current, that populist current, we're saying rather swim with the current. Go with the people and encourage it, you know. So with regards to uh, 2018, um, or just in terms of, you know, upcoming elections, what are your plans? And do you have sort of a cohesive electoral plan for smaller races? Are you focusing on any ones in particular? Depends on how, you know, quickly we can build this collaboration. You know, the first time that we run candidates, we need to be really put together. Right. And the people need to be really good because people are going to be, you know, they're going to be watching us to, to get proof of concept, you know. And so um, it's more important that we do it right than that we get caught up in the turmoil right. and kind of the immediacy and the chaos of electoral cycles. So with that, are there any platform points? I mean, there's a Democratic platform, but that means nothing. <laughs> are there any platform points that, uh, that you have going into this? Like these are some non-negotiable issues yeah. that if you want to be a part of this you know, party, you have to agree, you know, like climate change is real or something. Like are there platform points that you already have put together? We stand basically on Bernie's 2016 platform, you know, but we do, uh, we are elucidating our own principles, you know, kind of we're, in, uh, we're designing that now. Uh, for example, one of them, which I was very happy to see that practically everyone agreed with at the Convergence Conference, was that the new party needs to be independent of corporate money uh, and, and dark uh, kind of billionaire money and all of those and so what that effective, another way of saying that is that you need to cut off the mechanisms of influence that the oligarchs have over the party, you know, because we're not about to create a party that has the same kind of like tethers of control. And so that means cutting out corporate money and donations. Uh, it means not taking super PAC money. It means, you know, not, not having relationships or encouraging the growth of super PACs, you know. Uh, and it also means banning things like lobbyist gifts from corporations, 
It means closing the revolving door, making it so that, you know, politicians can't just go in, serve corporations during their tenure, and then retire to cushy multi-million dollar jobs on Wall Street. And so all of those things uh, is what's required to make it independent of control from the oligarchs. And so that is one of the principles that has emerged as something that we all agree on immediately and serves as a foundation for all of our groups to build upon. So finally, talk about what's coming up, uh, both in, in terms of what, you, what you're what you organizing around and also what's uh, happening in the Democratic Party. I know you mentioned uh, the, uh, the event on the 9th. Talk about what's coming up and um, how that will affect your organization and how people can plug into it. You know, we decided to do something novel after uh, after the Convergence Conference it's kind of, and, and come up with kind of a non-traditional role for volunteers and for people who want to help us. And that is, you know, that the traditional role for volunteers is kind of, you know, canvassing and making phone calls and collecting petition signatures and that kind of thing. But we said, let's make volunteers and people who want to work with us, let's make them emissaries, mm -hmm. basically, of a new party. And, you know, and entrust them with approaching other organizations across the country we have, you know, volunteers and state state structures in almost every state across the country, and having them approach people um, and organizations and chapters of organizations, uh, progressive groups, campus groups, you know, for example, local our revolution chapters, local DSA chapters, have them go and strike up conversations, you know, in those organizations about what it is that's happening, you know, and so. If you want to get involved with us and you want to, you know, build up that organization, you want to participate in representing that, then I definitely encourage you, come join us uh, and, and become an emissary of the idea of creating a people's party. You know, um, you'll be surprised at how receptive people are when you go to these organizations. To learn more about and join the Movement for a People's Party, visit forapeoplesparty.org. And that will do it for this week's Dose of Dissent. Thank you so much for watching. Please spread and share this with all of your friends, foes, and people you don't know. Check out the last slide and the show description to see the sites that we mentioned this week's show. And in the interim, be sure to visit us on social media. And as a reminder, I will be in Asheville, North Carolina this weekend performing some spoken word and visual projections at Firestorm Books. You can learn more about that at artkillingapathy.com. From the Devil's Den, good night and act out. And real quick, to keep independent, non-corporatized media like this show going, donate at occupy.com donate. If you'd like to donate directly to act out, visit patreon.com slash act out. Right.